Hello, welcome to my sample video for my presentation on the topic of business mistakes. And specifically when I say business mistakes, I'm talking about those where the business intuition or the business conventional wisdom might lead us astray. I think that's a really interesting topic to discuss and explore the exceptions to conventional business wisdom. And this is a, a great topic to discuss with a wide variety of business audiences and a, especially a broad audience in itself because it's not specific to any one business functional area. And so I think it's very applicable for conferences, events, organizations where you're looking for something that is informative and business related but isn't either too functionally deep or concentrated, really heavy material, or that it is too frivolous or strictly entertainment. It's a nice, it's a nice breath of fresh air, it's interesting, and, and uh, I think a lot of business audiences will find it uh, valuable. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a few of the examples of where our business intuition might lead us astray. And the first one I'd like to talk about for my sample here is listening to customers. And th this is uh, you know, commonly an expression, the customer is always right, you'll hear. And, uh, but there are several circumstances where it fails to work in your best interests. So for example, the first point I talk about is creating versus capturing value. This is an old negotiation concept. If you think about creating value, it's like growing the pie versus capturing value, which is getting a larger share. And the important thing to understand when it comes to listening to your customers is they might ask you for something like lower pricing. And you have to ask yourself if the incremental benefit to you, such in terms of loyalty or, or increased sales, exceeds what you are losing, which is that in incremental revenue. And so that's a good example of creating versus capturing value. If they are, if it increases the amount that you purchase, or pardon me, that you sell, it might be growing that pie. And so even if you maintain a share of that and you lose a little share, the growth of the pie uh, offsets the decrease of your share. But the capturing value means if they don't increase their sales, they're just demanding lower prices and you just end up getting a smaller share, you're sacrificing more than you're gaining. So always bear in mind when they come to you, and, and that's not necessarily a price, although that's the obvious example, you could also say increased customer service. You would want to know is the incremental cost, is the incremental value of that offering greater service exceed the incremental cost or complexity. The next thing I want to talk about is selectivity bias. If you're, at, if you're listening to your current customers, it's important to note that those are people who have already opted to buy your services. And there's a selectivity bias in only speaking to them. You're also interested in knowing what non-customers are interested in. And so that's, a, that's a, a dangerous path to follow, only listening to your current customers, because it might only reinforce what you're already doing. And so as you want to do surveys, it's important to remember, it's not just a customer survey you'd like. You'd specifically like surveys of non-customers. And that's more complicated to get, but it can, it can oftentimes be more valuable. The next example I use is that not all customers are created equal. And I want to go back to that original statement that I made about how uh, the customer is always right. That's a common thing that we will tell, uh, especially like service level employees, people who are dealing with the customers. And you know, I was a teenager when I worked in, in service industries and I was always told that because I think it's important that, that young people who might be a little uh, uh, self-involved learn to defer to someone else. But that's not necessarily true in all business matters, especially as you move higher up the value chain and get more sophisticated. You will actually want to learn to differentiate between customers that are profitable and customers that are unprofitable. And if you are listening to your unprofitable customers and they are telling you what you need to do, that is not the same as listening to a profitable customer and having in receiving their feedback. In fact, sometimes if you have an unprofitable customer, you actually would be happy for them to go. You'd prefer they not go away angry and complain to all of their, their peers not to use your products or service, but it, it is sometimes valuable to, if you wish to think of it as that way, hazing them out. A good example of this is, is my father. If, if you're ever, in, my father is a notorious uh, uh, ne hard nosed negotiator and cheapskate and uh, he makes sure nobody ever makes a dollar on him and if he is ever one of your customers and threatens to leave you should thank him and open the door for him on his way out. There's, uh, let's get a couple more issues. One of them is they might not appreciate an advanced concept. So for example if you're introducing a new product, a new style, not all customers might get it at first. 
And so oftentimes I used to work in the auto industry, we would have the issue, this would drive our stylists crazy because we would go to customer clinics to ask them what they think about a future design. And if they didn't like it, the stylist response was always, that's because they're using the here and now as their reference point. And in a few years, the here and now will look passe and we need to think to the future. And so customer clinics is a poor uh, way to determine that. And this can also be combined with the sort of, not all customers are created equal. Uh, I referred earlier to the profitability of customers. It's also true that some customers are thought leaders, that they are on the leading edge and that other customers follow the leaders. And so it's more important when you're talking about who appreciates future products, who you're vetting your new products and styles against, that you, you gave, give particular weight to the influencers or the thought leaders. And then the last point I want to talk about is it's important to note there's oftentimes a difference between what customers say and what they do. For example, if they say that your prices are too high, but they don't refu it doesn't affect their loyalty, they continue to purchase, then again, it combines with this create versus capture, you're going to lose more than you gain by, uh, by it, uh, cutting your prices. And that also works, again, not just for pricing, but you can think of that in terms of service or loyalty. You want to make sure that, you know, if they say they, they're angry about the customer service, make sure that it's something that you're actually uh, getting behaviorally, uh, that, that's showing up behaviorally. And you can test for this. It's especially valuable if you're in a, a business or an industry where you can have uh, control groups and variable groups and do scientific tests for that, where you can do a test on a select set rather than the whole group. So for example, you might, if you can find a place where you don't have to, if you're in a business where you don't have to change your pricing across the board, but you can just have a sample set and change their pricing, that might give you a better, uh, uh, a better feel for what they're going to actually do rather than necessarily what they say. Now for my next example, I like to talk about demanding results. This is a common refrain among a lot of the executive classes. There's a lot of uh, table pounding and chest pounding. I believe in results. And there are several ways in which that can lead you awry. And I want to talk about two examples of where that fails to account for risk specifically. So if you have a situation where, let's say I brought to you an investment opportunity to your business that would cost you 10 whatever units, let's say dollars, and had a probability of success that was very low, it's only 10%, but the payoff would be a thousand. Now you might say, if, if you believe in the results and you demand results, no employee on your staff would take this chance because there's a 90% chance of failure and that means a 90% chance they'll get passed over for the next promotion if they suggest this investment. But if you use a mathematical uh, uh, a procedure called an expected value, which is how you sort of value uh, risk and return, what you would do, and this assumes you're risk neutral by the way, you would take the 10% times 100, and uh, pardon me, 10% times 1,000 would give you an expected return of $100, and $100 greatly exceeds your cost. So that's a very good deal. It's a very reasonable investment to make. But because you're demanding results, you have uh, employees who have a 90% chance of failure and are most likely to pass on this. That would be a, a false negative. Let's take a look at the opposite example. Let's say I brought you an investment that would cost you $10 and has a probability of paying off 80% at $12. You might say, well, look, this is a high likelihood of success and I'm demanding results. So as a, this is a smart career move. But again, if you take the expected value of 80% times uh, $12, that, that's only 9.6, which is less than your cost. So your expected value, your expected return is less than your cost and that's a bad value. This would be a false positive. Your employees would be likely to take this deal even though it is in negative in terms of the expected return. And I'll give you a couple of real life examples of these. The low probability of success that would have a big payoff. During the er early era of the internet, Microsoft was working on a lot of technologies, proprietary technologies, that could have been used to create the internet. Now, technically, this isn't their public statement. This is my interpretation. But I think what they were trying to do is develop a proprietary internet because they had a great success by having a proprietary operating system that had a network effect. And when the internet came to threaten that, they wanted a proprietary internet. And that did not work. Uh, and it was probably unexpected that it would in the beginning, but the payoff was so high, I still think that was probably a reasonable investment to make. Let's take another look at the example where the probability, where you, the, uh, you might take a false positive. For example, if I brought you a, uh, a 
uh, as an investment manager an opportunity where you could give me your life savings and I would double your money overnight, that would sound like a good result. What did I do? I took your result, I took your life savings, I went to a roulette wheel, I bet on black and I won and I doubled your money overnight. Is that a good deal? No, the answer is because of the risk. And that's an example of where demanding results, a high result, there it's in the payoff, not necessarily the probability, um, but that, that's an example of where demanding results would again lead you to an erroneous conclusion. And the last one I wanna talk about, this is sort of a mathematical risk assessment. This one is more of a cultural issue. I call it the invasive species. If you have an organization where cooperation is high and the people have really learned to work together as a team and you bring in an outsider who is more of a, for lack of a better word, a shark, an aggressive person who will take advantage of some of, their, uh, some of the team's uh, collegiality to sort of take credit for their work, what you will find is that person will immediately start showing results because they're used to a shared result and now they're concentrating it. They're taking advantage of everybody else's generosity and and this could, but that is obviously not something that you would want to do because this will create problems for you culturally specifically you will see the result you will reward it because we demand results and then you will find that the uh, the the rest of the team will lose its cooperative nature because they see negative behavior being rewarded and so they will adopt it themselves and so that's sort of a cultural area where demanding results can lead you awry and now for my last example I would like to talk, oh, let me just make a conclusion on that. So in terms of demanding results, what you find there is that if you're constantly talking about how you're demanding results, you might implicitly be saying, I'm not smart enough to understand risk reward, or I'm not smart enough to understand office politics, and, and to judge a decision based on what was known at the time in terms of risk. So uh, neither one of those would necessarily be flattering to your reputation as a manager. Now let's get to a uh, sort of my last section here for this sample. That is um, uh, starting with the high productivity. Now typically we think of productivity as being a good thing and high productivity being positive. And oftentimes what we end up doing is tracking what's measurable. And I have to admit I've done my share of this. I've been an industrial engineer as well as a, as a finance person. So I'm always looking to get the most from the least. And I'm always trying to make sure that we're at a very high utilization. But if you think about it, if you take your employees and insist that they are highly utilized and, uh, that, uh, and oftentimes if you have a, uh, if you end up with some difficult times, you will lay off some people and you will try and put more work onto the others. It's important you realize what you're losing in this, even though you might be gaining some, some short-term financial benefit. By, di by removing the discretionary time that your employees have because you're now at 100% utilization or even maybe over that if you've got them working overtime, especially without extra pay, you are now in a position where they are not going to be able to do a lot of the creative projects or pursue a lot of the more interesting things uh, and that might be demotivating for them and they might you might increase your turnover and it also might be the fact that you will miss opportunities because there are opportunities that you know if they've got their pet project that that really could grow into something uh, they will be foregoing that just to maintain that high level of utilization because every every hour, every minute of their time is dominated by uh, the emergencies and the fighting of fires. And so that's a way in which utilization, high utilization can actually be detrimental to the business. And uh, productivity isn't necessarily the same thing as utilization. You might say productivity is output versus input. Utilization is maximizing your input. But I think you can sort of understand that uh, if you insist on high productivity, that will oftentimes lead you to high utilization and that means you could be missing some opportunities. And the, the last section I want to talk about is a similar situation. It's, it's, it's along the lines of tracking what's measurable. Typically, when you're doing highly innovative projects, you will, have, you will look for what's the market size, what's the opportunity. The truth is, a lot of core research, that's not necessarily known for. And so what you end up with a situation is people who, if, you, if you're very disciplined in your business case process, which is normally something we would intuitively think of as good, but you might miss out on innovative processes because the result is not clear at the beginning of the investment. And as a result of all of these things, you see some of the more innovative companies taking uh, um, some, some interesting measures. Um, what some people will allow people to have uh, time off or extra time to work on their own pet projects and in terms of business cases 
Some people will, are, or some companies are really good about investing in core research without really knowing where it's going to go. And those, uh, those companies, especially in the tech companies and the innovative companies, they like that. It's also important to note though, it doesn't necessarily have to be what's not measurable. For example, 3M, which is generally considered an innovative company. They're not in tech, but a lot of their revenue comes from products that were developed within the last few years. They depend on that for their growth. And what they say is uh, about 30% of your revenue has to be from products brought forth in the last few years. So they're actually measuring those things and they're actually measuring the revenue to make sure that the innovation is there. So there's sort of some competing schools of thought. But anyway, those are some examples of some, some what I call counterintuitive business mistakes, things where you're following what seems logical and, and it leads you awry. I've got several others. If, this finds, uh, if you find this to be uh, something that might interest you, please contact me for a proposal, and I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.